uh, we are good to go uh, when you are, Your Worship. Thank you. And I see 629, so I'll call the members to come on screen. It is now 6.30. Councilor Buderick, are you able to come on screen? Thank you. And I would note that Councilor Porter has let us know she's having some internet difficulties and ex ex expects to be able to join us fairly soon. And there's Councilor Gordon joining us now. So with that, I will say welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Committee of the Whole for this Monday, March the 7th. We've had no closed session today, so we are starting our open session. And uh, I will remind everyone, this is a virtual meeting. And as such, all rules of order, code of conduct, municipal conflict of interest, et cetera, all pertinent legislation are in effect as if that we're meeting in person. If any member of council's connection to the meeting is lost or pa paused, we will pause for a moment to allow that member to reconnect. Uh, and uh, if they cannot reconnect within a few minutes, we will resume the meeting, assuming we still have quorum. At this time, as I say, the meeting is now called to order and we have an agenda before us. Is there anything to add to the agenda this evening? No, Your Worship, not from uh, staff. That I'm aware of. From staff, I'm seeing no hands from council. And then I will ask for a motion to approve the agenda as it is presented. Councilor Parks, so moved, and Deputy Mayor seconding. Any comments on the agenda? I see none. I'll call the question. All those in favor, please raise a hand. Any opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. Is there any disclosure of the pecuniary interest and in the general nature thereof? I see no hands. No disclosures, thank you. There was no closed session for this evening, so we move into staff reports. Item 5.1, an update to the employee code of conduct policy. And I believe this is being led by Ms. Wood. Welcome. Thank you and uh, hello to all. This is the first time I've been in front of council, so nice to meet you. I'm uh, Krista Wood, the HR manager. Um, tonight, I'm going to be um, just giving a brief presentation on the report that's in front of you uh, regarding the employee code of conduct. So I'm just going to bring that up on the screen now. I'm just going to share my screen here. Thank you. Um, just... and this one. Okay, so hopefully you all can see this now. Can everybody see that okay? I'm not hearing, seeing any objections. Okay. So um, as you've seen uh, in, in the agenda package, we're presenting a draft employee code of conduct policy and uh, just a brief history um, and why we're bringing this forward is um, it's an important policy that ensures employees share a common basis of acceptable conduct. So it sets the ground rules for all employees, sets expectations of employee behavior and conduct. All new employees review and sign off as part of the onboarding process. And for this update, current employees will be required to review the updated employee code of conduct and sign off that they understand um, the update. Um, so the current code of conduct was established in 2007. It was revised in 2009 and the current version was revised again in 2014. And the policy that's in effect right now references both council and employees. However, council approved their own code of conduct in 2018 in accordance with the Municipal Act. And so what this is doing is um, removing all the reference to council and making it solely for um, an employee code of conduct. So this uh, code of conduct follows best practice. We reviewed other municipal employee code of conduct policies and, and took uh, versions of those and created our own and also built on the code of conduct that's currently in place. Some items have been expanded or updated, 
but um, the general framework of what was there is still in place in this new uh, updated code of conduct. So we expanded the gifts and entertainment section to provide additional clarity and to increase the nominal gift value from $50 to $100 of what um, would be acceptable to still ac accept as a nominal gift. Um, there's a new section regarding conduct of staff at council and committee meetings. And there's a new section regarding whistleblowers and protection for people who um, would, would utilize that as a whistleblower. Um, so that's the main updates, but I can take any questions that um, any members may have at this time. Thank you, Ms. Wood. I will ask you to drop your sharing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And with that, Council, do we have any questions from Ms. Wood with regard to this uh, employee code of conduct policy? I'm seeing no, well, Deputy, go ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you. Um, in, the, in the report, it mentions conflict of interest and in then in the code itself it, it elaborates quite a bit on it um am i reading it correctly that for a conflict of interest the first step would be to your manager or if the manager or your supervisor sorry and if your supervisor is uh um or to your manager if needed i guess is Ms. Wood? Yep, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, are, you, are you asking about how it would be reported if there was a conflict of interest? Yes, how would the employee um, raise, raise the question of a potential conflict of interest, just to make sure that them and the township were, mm -hmm. everything was covered? Yeah, so they could bring it through their supervisor. Now, if the supervisor is the person in question, then they would bring it through the next appropriate uh, channel of management. Um, but if it was something that was, you know, quite serious, they could also bring it forward to their department head or to HR, depending on who is involved in, in that. Oh, okay. So um, the other scenario that I was thinking of is if a um, because there's some in there for like uh, political activities and things like mm. that. Um, if someone wanted to just make their supervisors aware that they were going to be in some political activity, which didn't contravene this, but they wanted to make sure everyone was aware just so that there couldn't be any problems later, um, would it follow the same process then? And is there any follow-up so that they have anything in writing? And what I'm thinking is, <laughs> it's because of my personal situation, but you always want something in writing saying you're okay. <laughs> so if it wasn't, uh, a, if it could be a perceived conflict of interest, but it may not actually be a conflict of interest, it's always best to report. And then something, some kind of note would be made on file that this person had brought it forward so that if anything was questioned in the future, then it uh, would be documented that they had disclosed that. Okay, thank you. That's that's what I wanted to clarify because for me, I, I find it encouraging that staff engage in the community and, and take part and actually um, step up to whatever they may be able to do for any community. So um, we need to make sure everything is okay, but we don't wanna, um, make obstacles for that either. So that's a good, thank you. Anyone else have questions? I'll go to Councillor Townen. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I welcome the, the addition of the section on whistleblowing. I have a particular question uh, with regard to um, basically the initial sentence which defines whistleblowing can be described as the identification and announcement of an observed or suspected misconduct by another employee or individual. Um, in terms of individual, can that include members of council? Through you, Mr. Mayor. 
Um, it could. Uh, I know that council has their own code of conduct as well, and I believe there would be a way to bring forward um, misconduct, alleged misconduct for council through that. But this could also be a channel, and staff should be protected if there is some sort of perceived um, violation that they want to bring forward. Okay, Councillor Downey. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah, that that's that's basically what I what I wanted to know was that that you know that basically if if a member of staff identified um, you know something worthy of whistleblowing with respect to a member of council that they were protected from any kind of uh, of retaliatory uh, action. So that answers that question. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else have question or comment for Ms. Wood? And actually, I do. And Ms. Wood, uh, I note that this is that there are the old piece of, of policy was described as for council, committee members, and staff. The current two two pieces would be one for staff and one for uh, council, and I believe committee members fall into that category. But what I'm thinking about is the volunteers that may not be on committee, but may be working, say, within uh, our heritage division or recreation division, something along those lines. Uh, where would they fall under this? Would they be considered staff for this purpose? Uh, I don't believe they would fall under this policy. I believe the, and I will refer to the clerk. I think she has her hand up, so um, she can probably best answer this question. Thank you, uh, Madam Clerk. Yeah, through, through your worship, I believe uh, a volunteer policy is coming forward and, and uh, uh, would, would speak to that in regards to because they're not known as employees per se and they're not on a committee. Uh, but I believe, that, uh, and we'll just have to double check that it may be within a policy that is coming forward or came forward in regards to the volunteers. So it would be a code of conduct for volunteers as a, a separate piece, presumably. It I don't think it'll be a separate policy. I think it'll just be a reference to of, of what that would uh, look like. Understood. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments with regard to the staff code of conduct policy? Seeing no further questions. So thank you, Ms. Wood. Okay. Council, what would you like to do with this? We have a recommendation before us. It's including an or. <laughs> Deputy, go ahead. Move to receive and adopt recommendation number one to bring it to council for consideration and approval. Thank you. That's so moved. Councilor Town in your seconding. Thank you. And mover and seconder, any comments with regard to that? Just mover, go ahead. Just briefly, um, just thanks to staff for continuing to bring um, updated policies so that uh, we can keep everything up to date and uh, and uh, stay current. Absolutely, thank you. Any other comments? I'm seeing none. Then I'll call the question. All those in favor, please raise a hand. Any opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wood. We will carry on to Item 5.2, which is the 2022 building permit rate study. And I believe Ms. Merritt is coming on. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, so through you, um, I'm just going to share my screen here and um, Hello. There it is. Share. Oops. Okay, everybody sees that? Seeing nods. Yes, I am. Go ahead. Perfect. 
Okay, so before I get started, um, I wanted to thank the finance division for completing this study in-house. Uh, Ms. McNevin, the finance supervisor, will jump in for a couple of slides uh, to explain uh, the different scenario being proposed and their respective impact on cost recovery. Um, oh. I don't think the slides are moving forward. Uh, try again. It just moved, the, added the second label. There we there go. There you go. Okay. <laughs> Um, okay, so staff requested uh, a fee increase uh, at the end of 2020 uh, for 2021. So if you remember, we asked for a $1 increase for $1,000 of construction value, as well as a value adjustment uh, from $120 per square foot to $145 per square foot. So that uh, request was made a year ago. Um, staff made the commitment to conduct an, an in-depth uh, review of building permit fees with respect to a full cost recovery concept. So the goal of this study being presented tonight was to support in the development of a sustainable cost recovery model and to provide council options regarding the level of cost recovery. So regardless of the options selected, staff are recommending that the cost recovery model be reviewed at a minimum every five years and adjustments proposed accordingly. So should growth pattern change drastically in a short period, seems to be a hot topic right now. Uh, there is no reason why the model cannot be reviewed sooner. As per the legislation, a financial report is also prepared annually for council so with, with respect to revenue from building permit activity. So staff will be keeping a close eye on the goal of whichever scenario is chosen by council tonight. Um, and the beauty of having done this in house, the model can easily be adjusted. Um, as you know, the building division administer and enforces the Ontario Building Code. We currently have four inspectors, an analyst and a chief building official. Um, the code regulates the review and adjustment of billing permit applications and inspection fees. This is to ensure permit, permit revenue collected reasonably covers the expected cost of administration and enforcement of the code. On average, staff of the building division review upwards of 500 applications annually, <coughs> of which 350 to 370 are approved. So permit Permit fees are collected at permit issuance. Not all types of permits are based on construction value or building area. Some are based on a set fee like pool enclosures, decks, uh, part eight inspections for private sewage service. Um, the study looked at the construction value based type of permits only. Um, as of the end of December, 2020, the accumulated deficit amount to $343,000, uh, a surplus of $239,000 is projected for 2021, which will reduce the net deficit to 104,000. Sorry, I'm throwing a bunch of numbers at you, but it's, it's all gonna make sense in a second. <laughs> um, so this table shows the number of permits issued each year by permit class. And as I mentioned earlier, please keep in mind that the number of applications reviewed in a year is roughly 20 to 30% more than the number of permits issued. So drawing your attention to the residential classes, the last two years definitely show growth in a number of new homes being built, but there has also been a sharp increase in the residential dash other class of permits, which includes renovations, uh, permits, these types of permits are based on construction value. And there's, it also includes the fixed fees based permit, like the decks and the pools and the sewage systems. So if we're focusing on the new residential class of permits, the five year average is 125 permits issued annually. Uh, but both, as you can see on the graph, um, 2020 and 2021, at 133 and 158 new residential permits issued respectively have exceeded the five-year average. 
So despite the fluctuation from year to year, uh, the most recently completed growth study determined that growth remains linear. We keep increasing, but it's pretty linear. In the approved 2019 growth study prepared by Hansen, projections for the time frame of 2022 to 2026 is 610 units of residential growth, um, which is in line with the five-year average presented on the previous slide. So roughly 125 units of permits a year. Based on that information, it is reason reasonable to project an annual reven revenue of $640,000 from building permit fees using the five-year average of permits issued for new residential permits and a breakdown is provided here. So we just projected the, the, um, the five-year average on the annual non-residential and the other classes as well. Um, this graph illustrates the cyclical permits revenue over the last nine years. So I need to note annual fee increase in the permit fee per $1,000 of construction value starting in 2017 and a change in the base construction value per square foot in 2021 from 120 to $145. Uh, this graph also illustrates the cyclical impact of uh, industrial, commercial and institutional development with a peak in 2017 from the windmill construction project. Uh, we're expecting another increase in ICI, sorry, industrial, commercial, and institutional permits uh, with all but one lot sold in the Lotus East business park currently going through the site plan approval process. So we are expecting some permit approvals in 2022 and the rest in 2023 for that class of permit. But these types of peaks should not be expected each year. So we are using a five-year normalized average of just under $600,000 for comparison purposes. And normalized in this case means that the peaks caused by the ICI activity has been removed. So the red bar on the graph is the projected annual revenue from the previous slide set at $640,000. This, project, this projection is approximately 71,000 higher than the normalized five-year average. Although it is important to consider and compare with permit, permit activity that has occurred in 2021 with the growth projections of the Hansen study, the purpose of the study is to calculate a stabilized permit fee structure that can accommodate annual fluctuations. Um, let's move to expenses. So the study includes further details on a year-to-year -year expenses over the last nine years. Um, you would have seen it in the study. Um, notable increases were in 2015, 2018, and 2020, and um, it lines up with the hiring of, the, of additional staff. So the analyst was hired at the end of 2014, the third inspector uh, was hired in 2018, and the fourth inspector was hired in 2020 to handle part eight approval and inspection of private sewage system, um, which was downloaded to the municipality from the public health as of January 1st, 2021. So since more than 80% of annual expenses is related to staffing and administration costs, the impact of adding staff makes a lot of sense. Um, the 2018 increase in expense is also related to software costs to modernize the building permitting process. So not expecting to add staff in the building division for the next five years unless growth drastically changes and we can no longer meet our service standard. So staff must also, must also consider staffing levels if growth plateaus. It is a very delicate balance. Uh, so the summary of projected costs per annual per, per year is what this slide illustrates. Please note that if you try to compare the annual budget for this division to the projected cost, it won't line up uh, because only the cost to enforce and administer the code are included for this review. So the cost of enforcing property standards and other duties as assigned are not included in this, uh, in this projection. 
So this study includes a projection of total direct costs of $690,000. Direct costs, um, there, it's associated with the review of building permit applications and inspections. So costs like staff training, equipment, vehicles, legal fees, for example. Uh, indirect costs of $140,000. Uh, that's cost uh, that supports the review of the permit applications. So good example is maybe uh, IT support. With the repayment of the accumulated deficit and software, uh, the projected annual cost has been set at $763,000 for the purpose of this study. So with a projected revenue of 640, as previously mentioned, uh, we are looking at an annual deficit of 123,000 if the rates remain status quo. Um, so now that the stage has been set, uh, I will invite Ms. McNevin to prevent, uh, sorry, to prevent, to present what the permit fee would look like for a full cost recovery and scenarios for council to consider. And I can keep moving the slides around, Brianne. Just let me know when to move. Okay, great. Uh, any questions so far? Are we just going to maybe touch base at the end? Seeing no questions pop up. Okay, great. Thanks, Ms. Merritt. Okay, I'm throwing more numbers at you. So <laughs> get ready. <laughs> um, so good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council. As briefly mentioned by Ms. Merritt, we have identified a normalized average annual shortfall fall, whereby forecasted permit fee revenue at the current rates does not cover forecasted expenditures by about 123,000 or 19%. In an attempt to break even in 2022, the township would have to charge $17.88 per $1,000 of construction value with annual inflationary increases placing the township's permit fee rate further towards the high end compared to other municipalities as outlined on figure six and page 19 of the study attached to the staff report. As noted throughout the study, it is extremely important to reiterate that these forecasts are normalized and represent a standardized approach to periodic review of permit fee rates. The fee structure should be designed to build and actively utilize a stabilizing reserve fund due to the volatility of permit activity um, that we definitely have seen in the last five years. Uh, the township will need to repay the remaining accumulated deficit, as Ms. Merritt has mentioned, of $103,000 before starting to contribute to its reserve fund for future dips in permit activity. And unless the township experiences higher than normal permit activity in the next five years, this will not begin until 2026. Next slide, please. Thank you. So given the extent of this increase, staff have provided council with four scenarios for consideration um, to kind of help with their decision making. So the first one is setting the rate to fully recover average annual costs. This rate is mentioned of $17.88 per $1,000 of construction value would yield an average permit free of about $4,300, um, which is an increase of about $700 from the current rate. In staying true to recovering 100% of costs each year, the rate would also require an annual inflationary increase, as mentioned. This rate would incorporate a contribution towards the accumulated deficit and future replacement of capital costs. Based on normalized activity, the projected accumulated deficit is expected to be nominal by 2026, but if permit activity remains extraordinary, as we've seen, it may be repaid sooner, um, and the township would then start contributing to the re stabilization reserve fund for future years a bit earlier. The second scenario is to phase in the previously noted increase over five years which is about 58 cents per year and $15.58 per thousand dollars of construction value in 2022. An average permit fee would be about $3,800, which is an increase of $140 or 6% from the current rate. This scenario will prolong the elimination of the accumulated deficit, but gives the opportunity for a more stabilized rate change on the next rate review. The projected accumulated deficit by 2026 is about $400,000 based on normalized activity. The third scenario is to keep rates at status quo, which is as mentioned, $15 per thousand dollars of construction value. 
at an average permit fee of about $3,600. The accumulated deficit by 2026 is projected at $770,000 based on normalized activity. Although the township may still experience one or two years of higher than normal permit activity, it is unlikely that the division will be able to effectively use its stabilizing reserve fund when needed under this scenario. Lastly, the fourth scenario is to fund permanently and prospectively 20% of costs included in the study from the general rate property tax levy. And 20% was kind of arbitrarily chosen because that historically was the deficit that was typically budgeted year after year um, in the building division. So this would eliminate the division's accumulated deficit by 2026 and would slightly decrease the building permit fee to $14.31 per thousand dollars of construction value with annual inflationary increases. This generates an average permit fee of about $3,500 in 2022. And based on normalized activity, the impact to the tax levy, if we permanently fund it this way, is an average increase of about $160,000 or 0.8%. In years where the division may generate a net surplus, a general rate would be entitled to 20% of that surplus as well. Um, so with that said, I will pass it back over to Ms. Merritt for closing remarks, and I will be available to answer any finance-related questions you may have during the discussion. And I believe there is an extra slide at the end that kind of outlines all of those scenarios a little bit better for you to kind of reference. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. McNevin. So, um, so the next step is based, um, council is to provide direction regarding their preferred scenario. Um, once we had the preferred scenario, we can, we can prepare a draft bylaw to amend the fee based on the scenario uh, chosen by council and then um, have a notice of public meeting. And that's only if the, if the rate changes. If the, if the rate remains status quo, then we wouldn't go through the draft bylaw in the public meeting. Um, so in a second, I will put the recommendations. I have a, a slide with the recommendations uh, for council to consider, and we can go back to any slides presented. Um, so we'll be happy to provide any clarification or additional information. So here's the, um, the recommendations uh, from the report. Okay, thank you. Council, this is a lot of numbers and, and a lot of direction. Uh, I'm assuming there might be some questions. I'm not seeing any hand. Oh, go, I'll go to the deputy. Thank you. Um, through you to one of the presenters. <laughs> I'm not sure which one wants this. Um, in looking at the, I'm just looking at the chart on page two of the report, which was in your document as well. It shows the different uh, options and the projected deficits along with it. Now, number two, which is the phased in, if I'm reading this correctly, if we do the phased in, we're going to still run a deficit of over $400,000 by 2026. Am I, is that correct? Go ahead, Brianne. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yes, that is correct. Although we are still moving towards kind of a positive impact in terms of the rate. So instead of, you know, a $770,000 deficit by 2026, we may only see 400,000 um, based on normalized activity. So it's just kind of a happy medium between, you know, not going full bore on the rates, but also looking at the fact that we are not fully cost recovering um, and we are kind of doing it that way. So yes, we will have annual average deficits, just not to the magnitude of what we would be if we were status quo. Just a follow up if I may then, Worship. Um, so my, I guess my real question is, I like the idea of the phased in, so that's not a huge impact rate at the start, but I certainly don't like the looks of number three or four where we're just continuing to accumulate debt or 
putting it onto the taxpayers. Um, I, I, I really believe that this is a cost recovery item and we should treat it that way. That's my personal thoughts. So if we go to with scenario one, like you said, it's gonna be quite a jump right away, which will have a lot of impact on, and I'm, I'm looking at you know residents that might be looking at doing something and then all of a sudden there's a huge jump. If we do the phased in, I'm, I'm wondering what the phase in would be if we could still end up at, by 2026 with a deficit around the $10,000 mark, the same as scenario one, but phase it in over the same length of time, like instead of 58 cents, would it be 80 cents, 80, something like that? Like it was that looked at or is there a number that we could could be thrown out? Um, through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so there a little bit of clarification there. So scenario one, that does bring our deficit by 2026 to the nominal amount. So if we want to have a lower deficit, but not quite $10,000 in scenario two, we, you could always just up, like if you want to run some numbers, we can definitely, since we are in community of the whole, we could definitely look at what that would be. Just that, if, if I may, your worship, please. That, that's sort of where I'm going is, I wanna see a full, I wanna see us as close or at full recovery or as close as we can get. But I do like the idea of phasing it in so that it's not a big shock and yet, and it's very planned so that anyone who's looking at building um, in advance, they're gonna have an idea of what they're looking at, even in future years. <laughs> As noted, this is Community of the Whole. We can do it a little more casually. Ms. McNevin, would it be possible? I don't know if you have a spreadsheet built for this, but could you plug in using the deputy's uh, example of 80 cents over the five years or maybe a dollar over the five years just to give us a sense of where that would leave us at the end of the five-year period? Yeah, uh, Mr. Mayor and through you. Um, so I just did a dollar very quickly. So we would get up to... Um, Sorry, we get up to $20 by 2026, and the accumulated deficit by 2026 would be about 138,000. Keep in mind that is normalized, so you never know. We could get some, some dips up, some dips down in between that might help us. Um, but that, yeah, based on normalized, we could, you know, cut it down to about a third. And if I may, if I may add as well, is of course we can bring the, um, the building permit rates much higher, but we also are, um, we need to consider that we don't want to uh, discourage people from getting building permits and, uh, and uh, you know, doing their renovations or doing their constructions without a permit. And we don't know anything about it because it's, it's, not, uh, it's not good for, for the safety of our residents. So we have to be conscious of that as well. Yes, point taken. Thank you. <laughs> Other questions or comments? I'll go to Councillor Parks. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, just more, uh, I guess, a comment um, going on with what the deputy was talking about. I wonder if there's an opportunity to do like a instead of a 58 cent increase, looking at doing like a 75% increase or 75 cent increase over the next three years and then getting us more to a stabilized amount in 2020. Four, um, leading to a point where we're not having a huge deficit at 2026. Because the difference between what I'm seeing at the two, 1558 and the 1730 is $2.30 over the next five years that we have to recapture. Mm -hmm. So if we could do 75 and 75 and 75, that's two, $2.25 over the next three years. And it's not a huge increase for uh, people that are looking to do building permits, as well as um, we all know that the building industry right now is, is booming. Um, so it would be nice to capitalize on that for the next three years. And then if it dips off in, in four years, then we've capitalized a lot of that at this point. Just my thoughts. 
Thank you through you, Mr. Mayor. Yep, so, um, that that sounds kind of ideal. That's that's definitely leveraging what we think may happen in the permit activity, which is a little bit different from what we're looking at in terms of the study approach and normalization. So yes, if we did 75% a year or 75 cents a year for the next three years, um, and then we kind of went to a normal, you know, kept it at $17.25 by 2024, we would be, you know, slightly below that $400,000 deficit because it, it isn't that far off in terms of our 58 cents. Um, so it's really up to you guys on what we can kind of tailor with a phased in approach for sure. Okay. Thank you. Other comments? I'll go to Councilor Ruderick, go ahead. Just curious if uh, any of uh, these thoughts have been brought into the whole idea of the uh, Amherst West uh, expansion um, and kind of where that might fall into this. I know obviously that's a longer term project and goal, but from sitting on the last meeting, um, I know that the uh, building community is very anxious to get started and move forward with that. Just curious if, if any thought was put towards that with, uh, with these uh, these uh, raises in, in mind. So through you, Mr. Mayor. So, mm -hmm. well, I have to say, yes, it's been taken into consideration because we're using the growth uh, study that has been put together by Henson. I'll just Brianne. Yeah. yeah, I'll just second that, MJ, just to absolutely confirm that. Um, yeah, when we did the development charges study, which we also cross-referenced the growth study, we did confirm that the growth projections did incorporate Amherst View West. Thank you. And do we have any, I'll just further to what Councillor Buderick was asking, we know that there is some um, uh, I'll say expanded interest in the bath area for some large growth uh, projects there. Have they also been included in this project? Not necessarily, as I say, outside of that normalized because of the study, but the pressure that's going on currently with the uh, housing increases. Has that been brought into this equation? So I will answer the same thing again, like whether whether it's Amherst U or Odessa or Bath, we're looking at the growth scenario, uh, at the growth study from Henson, which is like Lowell Township as a whole. Yeah. Um, and of course, I know there's a lot of questions about, you know, we're, we're being um, uh, a little cautious with the growth numbers, but because we're reviewing, like for this rate study, we're going to be reviewing this um, every five years or sooner since we, we keep an eye on, you know, if, if the building, uh, the new building permits issued in the next two years far exceeds what we would ever uh, expect, there is nothing uh, that stops us from bringing uh, a report back to council and uh, and presenting the results and then con confirming whether we want to keep the rates as is or do we want to put the brakes on a little bit or you know we could adjust that as well. Thank you. And, and if I may further to uh, the deputy's comments with regard to the 400,000 which I agree as an accumulated deficit over five years is a is a big chunk of money, certainly. Uh, and I agree with the concept that we're supposed to have here, and that is uh, that it is uh, self-sufficient and that the, the fees cover the costs. Um, no, but I note that as of the end of 2020, we had, forgive me, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but somewhere in the neighborhood of a $320,000 accumulated deficit. And at the end of 2021, our current estimate is it's about $100,000 uh, accumulated deficit. So we trimmed 200,000 off that over the course of one, well, that albeit anomalous year. We had a tremendously busy year this year, and it has trimmed that deficit by two thirds. So it is possible that other anomalous years could do similar factors. Of course, it is also possible the exact opposite can happen. We could have a year that we have very few. Uh, developments and uh, we end up with a much larger deficit. And uh, Mr. Renier, go ahead. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, through you. So just to 
add some context for that. So certainly this last year definitely helped with the accumulated deficit. The only thing I would, would note is that over the last decades, the last 10 years, seven of those 10 years did see a deficit in the building department. Um, and the two exceptions were this past year, which was exceptional with the residential. And the other big exception was the, uh, the windmills um, construction in 2017. So for the trend is systemically, they're, they're inherently, it's typically a deficit without some kind of um, anomaly, I guess. Um, and, and the other thing I would say is that just to build on that, um, yeah, $100,000 deficit going into the next year is certainly great. Um, and I would just say that's kind of in terms of setting the rates and wanting full recovery, but not wanting to quite go to 1788. I guess I wouldn't call it a gamble, but that's just the risk you take when setting the rate that if we have a couple more good years of growth, then we'll get to where we get to. And just to point out, I don't think it's been spoken to right now. We don't have any money in our building reserve fund. Typically, we do like to have a building reserve fund to get into the cycles where in down years, we have a reserve fund to fund it. Um, so any exceptional growth in the next couple of years could also be used to um, replenish that reserve fund that has been um, depleted and at zero for the last few years. And thank you for that. Uh, yeah. And in, <laughs> compre uh, it helps in our comprehension, certainly. Uh, one just double checking something, and I'm sure it has been considered, but you were showing us the, I believe, 860000 in anticipated cost for that department uh, uh, for the coming year. I know that is the average over five years as, as it's projected, but are you including a some level of CPI inflationary element uh, to that? Because we know that wages will go up over the next few years. <laughs> Um, yes, Mr. Mayor. So, so for the purpose of this study approach, um, the 763000 that Ms. Merritt had presented, that is the forecasted projection for 2022. And then when we look at the scenarios, especially scenario one, when we say that if we go full cost recovery at 1788, we would require a CPI increase to be able to take into account those inflationary increases year to year um, on the expenses side. So that projected deficit does incorporate the fact that we're gonna have inflationary increases every year on our expenses. Um, and then for scenario um, two and three, obviously we don't incorporate inflationary because that, again, it's kind of a happy medium to work towards a rate increase. Um, so in that case, the deficits that are in the, the scenarios incorporate the inflationary increases in expenses, but they don't necessarily um, rectify them. Okay. So, and again, just from my very clear understanding, what we're saying is to go, I'll say to that option one, year one, it would be 1788. Year two, it would be 1788 plus inflation. And then again, in year three, et cetera, et cetera. So the growth, uh, to the actual cost is is built into this. That's correct. Yes. Okay, thank you. Other comments or questions from council? Deputy, go ahead. Just blending that question along with uh, Councilor Porter's um, earlier, there was the scenario where uh, over like three years, we would have rate increases to get up to basically where the 1788 would be. I'm just going back to it. Yes. Yeah. Um, and that would still have the deficit, you said, in, this, in the neighborhood of the 400,000. But that, just another variation of that could be that. And once we hit the 1788, then the CPI could kick in as well, right, to try and lessen the blow, stay closer to the actual costs? Through, through your worship, yeah, definitely. Um, I, we tried to kind of simplify the scenarios overall so that we're not giving you too much and kind of bombard you. But yeah, definitely, um, you know, you, any phased in approach, you could incorporate some sort of incremental CPI without it getting too convoluted, I guess, from, you know, the public engagement standpoint and understanding what we're doing. 
Um, so, so that phased in to get us to what the rate should have been in 2022 in five years. That's again, just, a, you know, this is where it has to be this, but we'll work towards it and then we'll revisit. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate the fact you kept it simple to get us started. <laughs> <laughs> Not my intention that way, but. Anyone else? I'll go to Councillor Gordon. Here. Sorry. Um, I, somewhere in there, did I, uh, so are we sort of, uh, I guess, not approving or rejecting as many as, uh, as much as 20% of our applications? And I, is that uh, sort of in line with other municipalities? It seems high to me, but, uh, and the other thing is if, if they're rejected in their initial stage, does some of them circle back and uh, based on our recommendations, do they reapply or are they, most of these are gone forever. I'm just trying to understand that most people that I know when they're building something, they, um, you know, they expect to get the permit done and they're willing to pay. Uh, I worry that if we're making it too difficult, going back uh, to what was commented, we don't want to create a situation where people are building, especially I think of second level decks, but building anything that affects the safety uh, of the residents because they're, they're paying too much for the, the permits or uh, we're making it too difficult or there's too many restrictions or I'm just, I guess I'm just curious where we would sit with other municipalities. Uh, I'd like to think we're probably on average, but are we higher? Uh, I think that was mentioned that we were going to be considerably higher than our neighbors again on, uh, on permits. So couple of questions in there, I guess. Let's go through you, Mr. Mayor. So that's a great question, Councillor Gordon. Um, actually, the I wouldn't look at the 20 to 30% as rejections. The big majority of the 20 to 30% that are not being approved are like, it's just inquiries. People come to staff, uh, resident comes to staff, present their, their project. Um, and once we, we've talked through the projects, um, you know, we, we could issue the permit, but they don't actually come and pay the permit fee to take the permit out. And uh, we're assuming they're not continuing with the construction. So for whatever reason, like we don't know if it's because it's too much money or they just basically decided not to do it. Um, you know, decided it's not a good idea. Uh, we, we don't have those statistics at this time, but um, I, I don't know if it's fair to assume it's because, um, you know, the building permit fees are too high. There's just a lot of people coming to consult, um, give us an idea on a napkin and say, this is what I would like to build. And once we start talking about <laughs> the requirements or like even like how you would build this, um, you know, people just decide it's not a good idea in the end. And is that, would you get, is that, um, are, we're probably average there then. I mean, I'm obviously the same scenario where people are in Kingston or uh, Gananoque or wherever, and they're coming in there with some idea that they want to do. And then once it's, once they realize that uh, all the regulations and recommendations is probably not feasible anymore. So we're probably mm -hmm. on average, would you say in there? I, I would say we've never really done a full, uh, yeah. a full scan of what other, but I, you know, speaking with uh, with our chief building official, like he he said, that's a pretty normal number. Okay. I, I just wanted to illustrate there that although you see that you know 385 permits are issued in one year, we actually review a lot more applications than that. That was really the point we were trying to illustrate there. Yeah, I guess that's what surprised me a little. I I wasn't aware there would be that big a difference. Uh, mm -hmm. I was yeah. thinking smaller. <laughs> anyway, thank you. And uh, MJ, would I be correct in saying that uh, staff could end up spending a fair bit of time with someone with a napkin drawing and then they go away and there's no fees attached to that whatsoever because there was never an application and therefore it's just cost. That's correct. Yep. <laughs> okay. 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 Anyone else have comments or questions? No. What I'm hearing is that there may be some willingness to uh, 
I'll say do a a, a, a B, maybe with with it with an a, an adjusted value in B, but I'll look to council to uh, to come up with some kind of solution. It's up to you. I've got a councilor Townend. I don't expect much much joy, but I would I would make a motion to adopt recommendation one A and two. I'll, I'll take that as a motion, and, and I understand your position, but uh, do I have a seconder for that motion? I'll call again, do I have a seconder for that motion? Then I have to consider the motion with uh, dropped. Sorry, Councillor Townend, do I have anyone else willing to put forward a motion, an idea, something to move us forward? Deputy, go ahead. Thank you. Despite wanting to second the last one, I'm going to do a blended. <laughs> so um, I would move to receive the report, adopt one B as a phased in increase to, and I'm not sure how to word this because I wanted to say what, uh, Ms. McNevin had proposed. Is that a dollar, Ms. McNevin? By, by a certain, by a, what was it, 2024, we would be equal or 2025? Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, equal, sorry, I need some or, clarification on that. Sorry, the, there was one where you did it that it was like a, a it was a it was a it was a percentage increase for I believe it was three years and then it would match basically the 1788. Was that the 75 cent one? The se uh, 1788 just one. Sorry to <laughs> I just I, can't remember the numbers. Okay, I'll, I'll go to uh, while while uh, Brianne's trying to figure that out. I'll go to MJ. Sorry, I just, if I could, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I think the clarification here is if you delay the full recovery by a couple of years, you're not going to achieve the reduction of the full um, deficit within that. Let's say you're looking at a three-year increase. You're not going to achieve that. The only way you will achieve not having a deficit at the end of the five year period is if you right off the hop start with 1788 and then it increases by, by CPI. But if I, could, if I could suggest, I'm sorry, it's probably not following protocol here, but that what I heard, uh, I believe Councillor Parks mentioned and you as well, Deputy Mayor, it was the 75 cents increase per year for the first three years that will take you to the 1788 at the end of year three. And then you would do a CPI adjustment in year four and year five, but that will not take you to a reduction, a complete reduction of your deficit at the end of five years, because you've missed the first three years at 1788. Does that make sense? Deputy, yes. Go ahead. Yes, okay. it does. And that's my motion. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, Ms. McNevin, 75 cents this? a year for three years and then CPI after that. Okay. Okay, through you. To get at 1788 by the end of 2024, it's 72 cents okay. a year until 2024. And then, so 2024 including would be 72 cents. And then if you do an inflationary increase, let's say hypothetical of 2% or something for 2026, um, then it'd be $18 and 24 cents and you'd be at 330,000 for your accumulated deficit instead of 400. That's normalized. So it's not saying that's for sure what's gonna happen, but yes. um, again, normalized. So that would be a 1572 in 2022. Okay. So deputy, your motion is for, I'm gonna say 72 cents or 75 cents? Yeah, it doesn't matter. Well, the 72 cents will bring us to the, well, uh, 
75, 75 cents. That'll bring the inflation. Okay. In. Yeah, 75 cents and then inflation after that. Thank 75 you. 75 cents for three years and then inflation after that, correct? Yes. And in, yes. And then the rest of the motion would be to include uh, two as well. Yes. Recommendation number two. Yes. Okay. So through the clerk, do we have clarity on the motion? Yes. And I believe staff are nodding as well. The other staff are nodding <laughs> Sorry, as well. I my mute button. Right. And so we have clarity that it's three years at 75 and then inflationary and then item number two, which is the public notice, et cetera. That's your motion, Deputy. Do I have a seconder for that? Councillor Parks, thank you. Mover, any further comment? Just thank you to staff for walking me through that to begin with. Um, the other is I really like the idea of the full recovery rate off just the jump right now. But like I said, I, I really, I like us to have a plan as well as, <laughs> as well as um, balancing the books. And so I think this is a bit of a compromise on both. We've got a plan going ahead and uh, in the long run, we're gonna be better off. And with, this, with, and with the reports that are gonna be coming back to council um, along the way, um, any adjustments that need to be done um, can be done at those times. Seconder, do you have comment? Uh, just basically um, confirm what the deputy has mentioned in regards to his motion. Um, that was kind of my thoughts from the beginning. Let's start moving forward with this and, and then we can revisit it in a couple of years and hopefully um, we'll see a huge improve or huge increase in the uh, uh, building permits and, and not being a deficit. Absolutely. Any other comments? I'll go to Councillor Townend. Um, I, I, with the greatest respect for colleagues and the mover, I, and I'm generally okay with, with the direction, but as a point of principle, I'm going to uh, state my objection and that I won't vote for the motion. I think the most prudent decision in the interest of the taxpayer who are constantly on our case about the increase in our tax rates that a full cost recovery, though it seems a hard decision, we're elected to make hard decisions. And I think it's really the best and most prudent financial decision for us to make. So I'm gonna stand on principle on that one, I'm afraid. Thank you. Any other comments? None, no further comments back to the mover, no? Then I will call the question. All those in favor, please raise a hand. Any opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you very much. And thank you to uh, Ms. Merritt, Ms. McNevin, and Mr. Renier for uh, walking us through that very complicated formula. <laughs> thank you. We move forward then to township owned vacant land options. If I can get my mouse to work. We have a report before us, and this is uh, Ms. Merritt. So through you, Mr. Mayor, so Ms. Campbell has a short presentation uh, to walk you through this one. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Ms. Campbell. Sorry, I have too many things open. Good evening, Your Worship and members <laughs> of council. I apologize. Um, I'm just going to share my screen and... Hope that this works. Uh oh. Okay. Are you seeing the presentation? Yes. Everybody else seeing it? I'm seeing some nods. I okay. think we're good. Go ahead. Super. Thank you. So um, I'm here tonight to speak with you about um, some township owned vacant land and hoping to get some direction on some options that are available to council. Um, so just quickly, I want to have a quick chat about what we're not asking as part of this report, give you a bit of background, description of the vacant parcels, options for consideration, financial considerations, and uh, at the end I have a couple of um, options for recommendations because we didn't include any specifically in the report, um, but also happy to hear options that Council wishes to, to discuss as well. Um, so what 
this report is not. I have titled this slide. So I just want to be incredibly clear that um, we are not looking for any land to be de declared surplus and sold at this point. The focus is, of this report is creating a plan um, for these parcels moving forward. And Ms. Campbell? Yes. Before you continue, um, for some reason on my screen, and I don't know if others are seeing the same thing, the, oh, sorry. there was a, bl a black bar there. Yes, it's gone now. Sorry, sorry. thank you. Yep, <laughs> I have fixed that. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So um, just a little bit of a, ba a, bit, a bit of background. Um, this report has a link to the infrastructure master plan and the climate action plan. So, um, Staff is generally looking for direction with respect to the lands while the infrastructure master plan is being undertaken and the climate action plan is being implemented. So we want to understand if council wishes to have the transportation elements and servicing for either property included in the infrastructure master plan or whether either parcel could be used to advance the goals of the climate action plan with respect, with respect to tree planting, rewilding, access to nature, creating low carbon communities and increasing the active transportation network. So hopefully you can see this okay. There are two vacant parcels that um, we're hoping to discuss this evening. The first is parcel one, which is um, up in the sort of more Northern part of the screen. So it is a 5.7 acre parcel um, that is located north of Bath Public School and south of lands owned by Loyalist Estates, um, which uh, has a proposed mixed use commercial residential plan that's currently in design. Um, this parcel has frontage on Church Street and a stub road connection to Abidon Drive to the west. Um, there is water and sewer servicing available to Abidon Drive, but the capacity of pipes um, and the sewage pumping station capacity and treatment plant capacity would need to be confirmed ahead of servicing for this parcel and the other one that I'll speak about in a moment. Um, this land was acquired by the township through parkland contribution that's associated with the Loyalist Estates North Draft Plan, and it's currently zoned open space. Um, the second parcel, which is down um, toward the south of the screen, is a 12.5 acre parcel. It's located west of Bath Park and east of the recently serviced Loyalist Estates Phase 8 subdivision phase. Um, it is south of Empire Court and north of the Academy Street right of way at 1st and 2nd Street. It's currently zoned residential type 3, which generally allows for single detached dwellings and parks. Um, this parcel was listed in an inform in information provided to the county regarding options for affordable housing locations. Um, and while it's believed that it may not be the county's preferred location for affordable housing, some of the options presented um, for this land would allow it to continue to be used for affordable housing if that is the county's um, decision moving forward. So quickly, um, the options for consideration. So the first option that we always consider when looking at something like this is to do nothing. So in this case, that would mean leaving both, par both parcels vacant for the entirety of the 25 year planning period. Um, we're also asking council to consider um, whether planting trees on the parcel, which would contribute to numerous climate action goals as listed on the previous slide is something that's desirable. Um, it is the opinion of staff that the parkland contribution of 5.7 acres associated with parcel one should be maintained. However, this parkland could be moved to the southern portion of parcel two at the same size of 5.7 acres if council would prefer to develop parcel one up in the north, air, the north area north of the school. The third option for consideration is whether the land is to be sold for development purpose purposes within the next 25 years. So it would be helpful to include transportation elements and servicing in the infrastructure master plan to ensure appropriate development. So this would include decisions such as um, road connections, sidewalk, pathway or trail connections and traffic considerations, as well as water and sewage treatment capacity and optimization of the connections to the collection and distribution system. Um, as well as stormwater management needs. 
Um, I just wanted to specifically note that in, in the case of, of either of the parcels potentially being used as future development land, um, water and sewage capacity at the treatment plants would be the limiting factor with, with respect to these lands. And if the lands are to be divested of within the next 25 years, it would be imperative that capacity considerations for those lands be included in the infrastructure master plan. Um, both parcels are located in the existing urban settlement area and are service adjacent, meaning that minor infrastructure construction would be required for their servicing compared to other areas of the township. Um, however, if we included the servicing in the infrastructure master plan, then that would allow us to ensure that servicing requirements and impacts would be planned for in a holistic manner. So for financial considerations, um, the future sale would represent a revenue to the township if that was desirable. Um, it's estimated that um, if all of those servicing considerations that I, that I noted were, were dealt with, that the value is estimated at approximately $40,000 per acre. Um, and as I noted, the major hiccup is the water and sewer capacity. So we need to plan for that in the infrastructure master plan. Um, with respect to trees, um, staff has been um, investigating the option of partnering with the conservation authority for low cost tree planting. Um, and it's estimated that on 5.7 hectares, 4,400 seedlings could be planted at a cost of 10 cents each for a total of $440. And that would go a long way toward our 20,000 tree goal. Um, and funding for this is available in the township's tree program. So I have listed a couple of options for council's consideration. Um, the first option is generally um, moving forward with the existing intent based on current zoning of the two properties. So it would be to retain parcel one as parkland and transition it to an urban forest with a pathway running through it. Um, and then to determine servicing and transportation elements for parcel two through the infrastructure master plan. The second option that I've listed is um, to switch the parkland to the south portion of parcel two. So um, down at the south end near, near sort of Raglan Road and the Academy Street right of way. Um, and that is adjacent to the existing Bath Park. Um, and then to transition the existing parkland in the north end um, to, to um, be serviced and sold, and then to um, also um, include options for servicing the north end of parcel two. And then uh, as a third option, I've listed, obviously, if there's anything that any member of council wishes to, um, to propose that that could be discussed also. So that is the extent of my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone has at this point. Okay. I will ask you to leave that map with the questions, the okay. last slide there on for just a moment, if anyone needs to uh, review those locations uh, and potentially has any questions. Members of council, do we have any questions at this time? I'm seeing no questions. Oh, I'll go to the deputy. Thank you. Through you, um, parcel two, if I don't recall what the plan looks like that is for the property adjacently west to that. I guess what I'm looking at is with the development that is proposed, can we easily incorporate a portion of that into that development? Or can can it be easily, not us? Can it yeah. be easily? Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, through you, Your Worship. So the the parcel to the west is serviced with a with a loop. Um, and there is a stub at the north, um, sorry, at the northeast end of that property um, in the corner adjacent to this property, there is a road stub um, and there is servicing available there. So connections to, 
to um, water main and sanitary. And then there's also potential connections to water main and sanitary um, to the to the south east also. Um, and at one point there was a discussion about the possibility of um, putting some servicing through the park and potentially a road that way. So those are all of the sorts of things that we would like to consider um, through the infrastructure master plan to determine um, the, the servicing scenario that provides the best value to the township. Okay. That answer your question, Deputy? Yes, it sounds like there's a few options. And so just to go back to your first slide, if I could, without, you don't need to go back, but just going back, referring to it, the ask, or tonight, it's not that we're surplusing or making a decision what is going to happen. We just want to provide you with what options we'd like to be looked at. Is that correct? Yes, thank you. Through you, Your Worship, that's that's exactly correct. So um, certainly not looking for any land to be surplus tonight. Um, just that, you know, as we're looking at traffic considerations in the infrastructure master plan, we would work in, you know, the hypothetical um, population that would be on those on those lands that that you know would be part of those traffic considerations. For example, that we'd be looking as we're reviewing sewage pumping station sizing and pump capacities and those sorts of things that, you know, we would we would put a hypothetical date on when these lands might be um, serviced and built out and and include those those sewage flows to the pumping station in in those reviews. That that sort of thing is what is what we're looking to do. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments or questions? And I have a few actually, if I could, but no one else wants to go first. Okay, Ms. Campbell, um, in regards to parcel one, the, par the land immediately to the north of that is part of the Loyalist Estates uh, plan right now, is it not? And it's going to be, I believe, commercial and uh, higher density, some apartment or condo type development there? Yes, Your Worship, that's correct. So there's, there's the current planning application for a mixed use commercial residential um, block on that on that land immediately north. And that would be entered off the uh, Loyalist Boulevard, would it not? The entrance um, to that or would it be off seven? They're proposing both. So they're proposing uh, um, one entrance from Loyalist Boulevard and then um, a second entrance uh, to to um, County Road 7. Okay. So those discussions are ongoing with the county um, with respect to, to that proposal. Okay. The property to the south of that, I can see that I'm assuming that gray blob is the uh, Bath Public School. Uh, the land yes. immediately around the gray blob and to its south is the parklands around it. Or the the play, school playground, etc. Right, that large block in between is that part of the school grounds? Yes. So our parcel one would abut land owned by the school board. Correct. Okay. So that is the property that we normally park on when we go to see uh, the fireworks. Correct. Yes. Okay. I just want to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so that helps. The other question I had with regard to, and this was kind of answered with Deputy Mayor's question, um, to the west of Parcel 2, there, at a little further west, if you will, there's a small water body from this map. Is that the one that's, a, that's part of the, the, the particular uh, golf um, section? And golf yes. course, golf hole. That's what I, was, I couldn't remember the word hole. <laughs> It is, um, yes, that's correct. Okay. And so the area, I'll say where the word bath appears on that map and north is that is the area where that uh, phase eight is being developed, correct? Yes, Your Worship, that's correct. In immediately adjacent our parcel. Correct. Okay. okay. So uh, I'm not sure, you can't see my cursor, can you? I can see your cursor. Oh, okay. So there's a, there's a, it's, it's service, it comes like this, and then there's a loop around like this, and mm -hmm. there is a stub 
a road stub right here um, that was that was that is being constructed or has been constructed as part of as part of the phase eight servicing um, to to provide a, a future connection to those lands. So that stub, both in roadway and in, in water and sewer facility, is, is because there was a plan to put uh, for future residential development there. It is because it's, it's zoned to allow for it. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, I guess my final question is actually a, 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 a question about future possibilities. And I'm going back to parcel one. And I look at the, you know, the, um, the little walkway that comes through that called Park Place there and uh, comes into the back end of that property. Uh, would it be feasible? Would it make any kind of sense uh, if we decided that the front half of that parcel would be you know, separated, sold, or future sold, <laughs> uh, but separated and potentially made into commercial because it's adjacent to that commercial residential section and on the, the, the higher volume roadway um, where we could make the parcel at the back uh, more green space and community uh, or more green space parkland uh, and trail based to allow that access to the school, the school property. Would that be a feasible option? Um, it, it could be. Um, so whoever owns that land would need to go through the rezoning and uh, possibly an OP amendment as well to, to allow for that. So that would be the typical process in terms of, you know, public consultation and all of those things. So um, it, it, it could be um, half of that parcel would be, you know, roughly just under three acres. So not, not, you know, a reasonable size to allow for that likely. Um, it, it, it could be a possibility. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay. That's that. So that was my questions. And now that I've got a, a much better understanding of what these properties are. So thank you very much. Welcome. Other members of council ideas, questions, comments, I'll go with Councillor Parks and then Councillor Buderick. Hi, I was just wondering if uh, Ms. Campbell could put up that previous screen with the options on it, just for review again. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, did you have a further question at this point, Councillor Parks? Not right now. Okay, then I'll go to Councillor Buderick. Comments more than anything. Um, looking at uh, parcel one and actually looking, I mean, I know the map's not there anymore, but um, Village Bath really only really showing Santana the park is the only real park that they have. I know there's tennis court and, you know, a ball diamond and things like that that are there that are considered park property, but they don't necessarily have a park outside of what's listed as for Centennial. Um, I'm kind of for uh, parcel one as a park. I mean, even if there is an idea where you wanted to split it, uh, your, your worship that, we wanted to put the front half as, as a piece of property that could be useful on one thing because of the high traffic and the other half being a park. And uh, I'm all for our initiative for the planting of trees on parcel two. Uh, there is an upcoming, we approve, not only did we approve that portion uh, that's parcel eight that you mentioned earlier and that space in and around the golf course, but there's the other piece that we approved the 170 ish lots to be expanded to 220 um, coming in on the north part portion of the, uh, the, the existing golf course. Um, I just I just think that uh, we're putting a lot of houses in there then we could use a little green space, that's all. That's just my thoughts and opinions. Thank you, that's excellent thoughts. Others, I'll go back to Councilor Parks. Hi, I just wanted to um, echo Councillor Buderick's uh, suggestions too um, and thoughts. I, I think that main hub area um, around the tennis courts area is probably best left as some sort of green space and um, we could look at different options for that parcel one. Okay, other comments? Anybody wanna jump in? No? Okay, I'll back to deputy, go ahead. Just a 
question for clarification back to Councillor Parks. Um, her last statement was, look at something different for parcel one. I, I'm just not sure what was meant by that. I just want to make sure I understand. Sure, I'm happy, I'm happy to clarify. Just basic, based on what the, um, the mayor was mentioning about possibly splitting that property or looking at, um, uh, you know, what, what other options are available um, to utilize that property. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, if I'm, if I can summarize what I'm hearing and I'm not trying to lead anything anywhere, but I think I'm hearing that the leaning is towards keeping the Southern property at parcel two for uh, greening, for trees, for something along those lines, uh, and maybe exploring some more options with regard to parcel one. And anybody else have thoughts that they wish to bring into this? And I'm looking for a motion. I guess that would likely end up being an option three as defined by council, but it's up to you guys. Councilor Buderick, go ahead. You know, I'm horrible with motions, but I'll throw it forward anyway. Um, I would definitely like to keep parcel two um, as a green space and it would be a great spot for us to get a head start on planting some trees. Um, and parcel one, uh, we keep it open. Uh, options, I like the idea of a park, um, but uh, I'm not uh, beholden to that. Um, but uh, if you get a second, or I'd, I'd explain it a little bit better. That's all. Okay. So you, I believe the motion that, that Councilor Bruderick is putting forward is to keep parcel two as green space and parcel one as, uh, I believe you're saying park and green space as well. Uh, for uh, for parcel one, uh, I will accept that as a, that's the intent. Yes. Okay, I'll accept that as a motion. Do I have a seconder for that? I see Councillor Town in a seconding. Okay, okay. Councillor Budrick, go ahead. Um, just so, like I mentioned in my statement earlier, we moved that one section in the north end of the golf course from 170 some lots to 220. There's going to be well more than 80 lots, if not 100, put in in the other section. That's over a thousand new people going into Bath in the very near future. Um, giving them some some green space would be, uh, you know, help with congestion. Uh, the way that lots are getting put together now, they're 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 tight, tiny. Um, it just gives people an outlet to uh, get in and get some fresh air, uh, maybe stretch their legs, and uh, you know, it's a great opportunity. Maybe even through the vibrancy fund uh, for Ward Two and Three to throw in some benches and a few things like that to to, to spend some money there to beautify it but that's just kind of the, the ideas I was having behind that. Thank you. Thank you. Seconder. Yeah. No? Anyone else have comments? Deputy, go ahead. Um, I'm not gonna support it the way it stands. I like the idea of keeping as much green space as we can, but we're looking at a planning, the future planning here. And I guess what I'm thinking is parcel one potentially has a lot of development. <laughs> Sorry to use the word twice, a lot of potential for development. Um, because it fronts on high, on County Road 7, um, there's a lot of uh, potential for something more than just houses. Um, could be commercial um, or whatever. So I like the idea of keeping that parcel included in the future planning so that we, if it goes that direction, we will have it in our system already and, it, and the planning would be done. Um, especially when um, from just the south side of it all the way down to um, the back of the houses on Academy, it's, open space as it is with the school and our current park. Um, there is a large area of green space there. And then right beside that park will be the other 12 acres, I believe it is, if I remember correctly, um, <clears throat> which according to this motion would be retained as, as uh, parkland as well. So when you lump all those properties together, you know, 
you get a 15 to 20 acre green space in the middle of a village, it's still a big chunk of land. And parcel one would be available for future consideration with the planning in place. Thank you. Other comments? Seeing no further, oh, Councilor Parks, go ahead. Just for clarification, please. Um, sorry, that's my dog. <laughs> <laughs> appropriate timing. Um, I, I thought that's what Councillor Budrick was talking about was possibly some other development type of thing too with, with his motion. So I'm just looking for clarification. Councillor Budrick? It was. I did actually have my uh, hand raised, Your Honor, or Your Worship, sorry, um, to, to clarify that to the deputy. Um, it is kind of, like I said, to be determined. Um, could it be planned right away? Yes. Um, but uh, I mean, like I said, uh, I like the idea of parkland, but that's uh, just my thoughts, not the uh, council's thoughts. But uh, that's why it's to be determined, not exactly council or parkland right away. Okay, that this may have been my error in summarizing Councillor Buderick's uh, uh, motion. Um, so if I'm understanding the clarification that Councillor Buderick just provided, it would leave parcel two as green space to be potentially to be planted uh, where parcel one would be, I'll say held in reserve for future analysis, P possibly park, possibly commercial, possibly split, whatever, you know, something along those lines. Is that a better understanding, Councillor Buderick? Ab absolutely. You're right. Thank you. And just to make sure, Councillor Townend, are you still okay with seconding that? Yes, okay. So we have clarity on what the intent of the motion was now, Madam Clerk. Yeah, so I just wanted to, uh, would uh, open space be considered wording for that? Uh, as as this is working towards building a plan that staff will be bringing back to us, I'm assuming, and I'll go back to uh, the director and to Ms. Campbell, is, uh, is this sufficient, I'll say direction, for you to start to build that plan. <laughs> Both at the same time through you, <laughs> Your Worship. Uh, I, absolutely, we just needed to know, um, you know, if if it's if that parcel one um, is not necessarily going to stay, you know, open space or, or built into a park. So if we're considering. Um, development there, then we can move forward with doing some planning analysis for servicing of that lot. And from what I understand, parcel two will have portions of it as well. So I, I believe we have the direction we need to move forward. Okay. Thank you. And I'm seeing the clerk nodding. I think I'm seeing council nodding. Okay. Right. Councilor Gordon, go ahead. I guess I need a little bit more clarification. So as it stands now, the motion is uh, that parcel two would remain a, a green land and, uh, and or park eventually, or plant some trees perhaps, but uh, uh, parcel one is going to, we're gonna have a study come back to see what potential, whether we wanna develop for commercial or residential. Is that, that's correct? I'm not sure that this motion is I don't asking really for a study. I, okay. I, I don't, I'm not sure that this motion is asking for a study. It's kind of leaving it open and undecided okay. at this time. All right. My, okay. I think that's, yeah. Okay, so parcel two is a park. Parcel one is gonna be left open. I think that's where this right. is right now. Right. Okay. I would say uh, <laughs> Councillor Park's dog certainly supported the uh, new park <laughs> idea, but uh, okay, I'm good with that. Thanks. Okay, and I'm seeing hands from the deputy and from Ms. Campbell. I'll start with the deputy. Thank you. Um, so just there's there's a lot of terms going around here. So I just want to make sure I understand this because we're from what I from what I read in it, we're looking at our infrastructure master plan. So basically, what I was looking for is is the land gonna be included in the plan or is it not? 
So the clarification I'm looking for is, is parcel one going to be included in the plan? And I, I think that's what it's saying, but we're using open space, which means parkland to me. And parcel two would be remaining as parkland and not be included in the plan. I just wanted that clarification. What is, what, what's planned on being in the plan and what isn't? Right. And my understanding, and again, maybe maybe it's my use of the of the term open. Uh, I was more considering it undecided open that that side of it, uh, and therefore still flexible. Which, to my mind, would mean that it would have to be included in potential for the infrastructure master plan, as you're saying for for plot uh, for the property one. Uh, for but I agree, if I'm understanding correctly, property two would be uh, deemed to be not. Uh, future development and therefore not included in uh, the infrastructure uh, asset management plan. Again, I'm looking for nods, for, at least nods from council to make sure that I'm on board here. Okay, I'm seeing a few. Okay. And Ms. Ms. Campbell, you had your hand up as well. Thank you, Your Worship. That was my question exactly. So that that clarifies things for me um, to some extent. So thank you. Okay, perfect. Okay, any other comments? Obviously, obviously, this is very long term, and as far as what we're aiming at doing and building into our our, our infrastructure plans, as well as uh, long term, as for where we want green space and parks, etc., for the village of Bath. So it's a good time to be planning this. Absolutely, I, I thank staff for bringing it forward, even though it's a little bit confusing. <laughs> Okay, I'll go back. I think we've had the conversation. I'll go back to Councillor Buderick if he has any final comments. I'm thinking, no, nothing there. Then I think I'm calling the question. All those in favor, please raise a hand. Any opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you very much. And we move forward to item 5.4 which is the bylaw enforcement policy service level matrix. And I believe this is a discussion with our clerk, Ms. Chapman. It is your worship. Um, I am just, uh, so I'm gonna just give a, a quick overview uh, uh, to begin with the, the draft bylaw enforcement policy was presented at the last COW meeting uh, with a resolution adopted at that meeting to bring the service level matrix to a future COW for discussion. Um, and to complete the uh, to complete the form. Uh, so, a quick overview, and it should be noted that the bylaws that were included in the in the attached um, document here and was sent out to council uh, is not inclusive, but it's more of a um, a snapshot of the more active um, enforcement bylaws that were. Um, um, utilizing right now. So again, not meant to be that there's not others going to be in uh, some of these, uh, you know, fire routes, uh, licensing bylaws, such as our refreshment vehicles, fill regulations, water and sewer uses. Um, you know, we would uh, include building code act, those types of things as well in the matrix as we, as we move it along. So this was just to, to, uh, to bring it in to council and I am going to share my screen. Uh, for a very short um, PowerPoint. <laughs> yeah, everybody see that? I'm seeing nods. Go ahead. Okay. It's not, yeah, yeah. Okay, we'll go this way. So again, assessing the complaint priorities. Um, these are things uh, to look at, which again is the potential risk to public health and or safety, the magnitude, nature and duration of the contravention, history of non-compliance on a property or by the co contravener, uh, potential short and long-term impact on a structure, the community and the environment, potential for setting a pre precedent, uh, resources available to resolve the matter, potential costs associated with enforcement uh, action, and the likelihood of obtaining the desired results. So I know there's always uh, in regards, like there's a lot of um, questions of why we don't go to, um, you know, to court on a, a number of issues, but if we don't have the um, 
if we don't have the information behind us to be able to uh, actually take that action to court, then it's a waste of money, um, you know, to, to bring it to that level to get what we want on it. So the service levels, and, and this will show through when I bring up the form again, but again, the so the service levels, um, what we're looking at on this is the proactive service level, which means a serious violation observed during course of duties uh, where the bylaw officer will take necessary steps to correct the violation. Bylaw cases with proactive status are the high priority. So I know it's a lot of, um, words in there and when we get to the chart it'll it, and you see some of the um, placement of, of the bylaws in there we can speak to what those what this actually means patrol uh, service level would mean again where the uh, bylaw officers tasked with periodic or routine patrols through all the parts of the municipality to seek out violations uh, one of this that we do is the uh, winter parking regulations um, we do active parking um, um, through the school zones. Uh, so those would be ones where they are actively act going out to uh, look for violations or to keep people moving uh, from those. So bylaw cases with patrol status are usually medium priority because again, it's a reason that we're, we're out there actively uh, patrolling so that uh, uh, it doesn't uh, uh, become a, a health and safety issue. And the reactive service level uh, means where the officer is out there and they see something. So they'll see a, um, a messy yard or a long grass, those types of things. Uh, or we've received a complaint from the public because, again, the public are our eyes for 99% uh, of the time um, that they bring that to our attention and a bylaw officer will go out and investigate. Uh, Sometimes the reactive ones are our low priority. So that's the service level. And then again, the viol violation priori priority criteria, sorry, is that whether it's high, where again, our main thing is, is whether it's likely to cause a health and safety issue to the public. Uh, medium, where the potential is to cause health and safety issues to the public. Uh, there's negative impact to the community and or the environment. And low would be unlikely to cause health and safety issues to the public, negative impact to community and or the environment. And just a reminder that uh, through this policy is that anonymous complaints uh, will not be investigated unless it is a high um, priority in that it's a health and safety issue to the public. So that is, as I said, it was a very short presentation on that part, but I, oh, I should have kept my screen share up because I am going to end this and I will put up the chart. Sorry, I'm the same. I probably have uh, a hundred uh, things open on my screen right now. Okay, so, oops. Let's lower that one, make that one bigger, and we'll go back to sharing. So this is a matrix that was uh, sent uh, to council and is attached to the uh, to the report or attached to uh, the agenda today. So the idea is is that uh, the bylaws that we have uh, have added at this time are ATV dog control, fireworks, noise control, open air burning, parking, property standards, safe property sign snow vehicle and zoning. Uh, the bylaw numbers are in there for, and what we will do is we can link um, the actual bylaws in this chart as well. So we'll make it as easy as possible for anybody who's looking at, uh, at the form. So the service level, the patrol, proactive, reactive, and then the priority. So the uh, service level, which is in here, I tried to color code this a little bit. Oops, let me back a little bit. Uh, so this gray or area are what's going to go in this service level. And then the priority is down here, which is the high, medium and low. So I think I did the um, sample one where uh, it was dog control and uh, it the typical would be because of the uh, part that would in that 
would have an impact on there would be that the patrol, they do patrol, they do proactive, they do reactive, and the uh, and then you could set the priority of, of what that would look like. So the idea was to go through, sorry, Your Worship, uh, for council to go through and set those. Um, and uh, we can discuss it as we go through if there's questions. Okay, just as a first first off, a purely administrative note, uh, I, we have lost uh, Councillor Parks. Uh, her battery died on her laptop, so she's uh, struggling with that at the moment. She texted me and let me know that, and she may be able to try to get back in, but uh, we still have quorum, so we will continue. Uh, with, with that said, uh, moving into this uh, bylaw enforcement service level matrix, okay, uh, does anyone want to, uh, first of all, do we have any questions about, I'll say, the process and the ideas behind this? Seeing no one with hands up with questions. I think maybe we're best out. Oh, the deputy, go ahead. So so tonight, your is the intent that tonight the, the service levels and the priorities would be filled in on this? Uh, through your worship, yes, that was going to be the idea because then it would form part of the policy uh, that would be going to uh, to council for approval. Okay, I'm okay. When I was reading that the report, I misunderstood that then. Okay. Okay, so we are trying to fill this in. And if I could, uh, as I say, I think I'll start with an, an the example. Uh, and I'll just go to number one, the ATV bylaw that's listed here. Um, and I'll talk through how I think of as we could be filling this in, I'll put it that way. And I'm glad this is committee of the whole to so be able to do it this way. Uh, first off, in the ATV bylaw, as far as its priority, uh, it is, you know, the idea of an ATV running through our, uh, our urban centers. I mean, our ATV bylaw prohibits uh, ATVs from our urban centers. It doesn't prohibit vehicle, uh, ATVs being used in the rural areas. To my mind, that prohibition is because it's a safety hazard. If it's running down our sidewalk and a kid jumps out, right, that's a problem. Uh, so I consider that to be a high health and safety issue. Right? Now, is this something that we should be having someone driving around patrolling looking for? Is it something that if our staff sees it, they should react to it immediately? And is it something that we should respond to as quickly as possible if we get a complaint about it? And to my mind, it is that proactive and reactive. I can't imagine us that we would be driving around looking for this, right? but I would consider it high because it is a health and safety concern for residents that would potentially be hit by this, these things. Madam Clerk, is that, the kind of conversation you're looking for? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. uh, and so if we have this conversation and go one by one through these, that is your goal? Yes. Okay. Right. Uh, anyone else like to speak about the ATV bylaw and its method of enforcement? And we're all in agreement that it's a high health and safety and it would be Reactive in that are proactive from our staff if they see it, and reactive to uh, our residents if they if they see it and report it, but not patrolled. I'm, I'm seeing nods. Okay, deputy, go ahead. I'm just going to make a statement overall. I guess going back to my original question, I I was thinking that this matrix was something that would be filled out by bylaw when they came on something. So, because I guess what I'm doing, I'm looking at all of these bylaws that are listed here, depending on what the complaint is, it could funder, fall under any of them. Um, it depends on what the ATV is doing. Um, same with dog control. If, it's a, if the dog is loose, but it's a mean dog, that's pretty high priority. If it's just that, somebody doesn't like the dog, 
then so I'm I'm struggling to try and figure out what is most important when the bylaws cover such a wide each individual bylaw covers such a wide range. So that's where I'm just putting that out right now that I'm just struggling to try and assess a service level and a priority level. Because I mean, even, even a sign or a snow vehicle or anything like that, safe properties, it can have such a wide range that to say that safe properties is low depending on where the property is and how unsafe it is, it could be very high. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. And I, I definitely understand your consideration. Councillor Buderick, I see your hand. Just a thought, um, because we're all gonna have different opinions on this um, and we could be here all night for 11 different items. Um, just a thought, how about if we were as, all council members and, and and we can even include council park since she her computer died um that we could uh maybe go give our ideas back to the clerk by friday and come back to the next committee the whole meeting where we feel this falls in to everyone and kind of try and come together with a consensus then because that way all our ideas are out there for discussion instead of having the discussion and maybe arguing over this for a while because if you get into like the deputy uh, said there are different variations on on, on on an issue with for example a dog that's just a thought anyway yep understood all right other comments okay right. i would uh, councillor gordon go ahead I just wanted to come. I, I agree with the Councillor Buderick and uh, as well that I would support an idea that, like that. Uh, while if that's what we decide to do and we don't get much further on this, I, I would like to take the opportunity while I've got the fellow councillors and uh, mayor and deputy mayor listening. I personally have gone on uh, uh, probably five or six um, property standards complaints. And I've been very frustrated uh, by the fact that whether it's Loyalist Township or whether it's provincial or fed, I don't know, but I would like to throw it out there that we should consider looking into ways to give us a little bit more, uh, shall I say, teeth in the property standards issues, because there's some of these uh, people that I've gone out to repeatedly and the neighbors have complained repeatedly and they're habitual uh, in that they either don't respond to it or, or, or they just have a mess again shortly thereafter. And in Amherstview in particular, we obviously, as everyone's aware, we've encountered a lot more issues with uh, rodents, rats in particular. And uh, so, uh, you know, they, it could be a, a safety issue right there if people are, we can't get them to keep their yards cleaned and, you know, uh, whatnot but anyway i just felt maybe we're it, while we're looking at this i would like to just throw that in there that maybe that is in particular property standards because again it's based on my experience where uh, you know in odessa i've gone to one guy i think three or four times and and uh, we go and talk to him and we don't seem to be able to do much so i uh, just wanted to get that in there as well thanks and I appreciate that. Thank you, Councillor Gordon. Right. Um, ahead of this meeting tonight, I had a conversation with the clerk and the clerk did prepare uh, some draft suggestions from staff. Right. Now, so far what I'm hearing is A, not really sure that this is the methodology as, as Deputy uh, Mayor pointed out, Every single one of these could be a high priority depending on its particular circumstances. So we may meet, maybe we need to be looking at a different methodology. Two, right? This is 11 items and, and everybody's gonna have an opinion. So under Councillor Buderick's idea, right, we would take these, you know, sit, sit with them on our own, check off what we believe is, is the appropriate column and then staff can collate that and bring it back to a future COW and at least have the, the generalized position. 
But I will say that the last one, as I say, our clerk does have a sample. Debbie, if you could put that up for us, just, just so the council can see it before we make a decision about how we want to move forward. And through your worship, I can walk through a bit on the methodology of, of why these were put um, it, it kind of the way they they are. Go ahead, please. Okay, so for the ATV, uh, I agree with what you were saying, um, um, uh, Mayor, but in all reality, for the most part, when ATVs are there, it's going to be OPP that are reacting to it um, anyways, because most of the times it's after hours or uh, our uh, contract officers don't have ATVs to go after them uh, or anything like that. So the actual enforcement part of it is, is going to be very difficult unless, you know, we can get uh, either a license or something or some identification from them. So as much, it's usually reactive and uh, the priority is medium because yes, it is like if there is safety concerns, we, we try to get out there, but it's not um, that we most times will be able to do it on a, as a, a high priority. Um, yeah. Most of the priority. time it will be an after the fact thing for our bylaw people. Yes. Uh, wherein with the dog control, uh, it is all three um, and it is high, whether it's, um, you know, a dog, uh, um, a vicious dog or under the dola or, um, you know, if it's a, uh, to pick up a dog, if it's dog barking, uh, which can hit both the dog bylaw or the noise bylaw or both. Uh, so they're usually high just because they generate um, a, um they generate complaints and and they will they'll continue until something gets done on on that part of it. Uh, fireworks again uh, for the most part is reactive um, in that uh, the fire department goes out when they are made aware of or see fireworks happening. Um, so it's put down as low, but I um, again uh, we'd have to double check with um, the fire chief on that as well. Uh, noise control, uh, we're doing that one as a medium uh, and again reactive in that uh, it's another one that's probably the most, one of the um, highest volume of uh, calls that we have is uh, neighbor noise, um, construction, uh, those types of things. So again, uh, for the most part reactive in that uh, it's we're not there to hear it, we have to wait for someone to uh, to call and, and let us know on it. The open air burning, again, I, I believe those are all based on uh, somebody calling in to the fire department uh, to go in and do those. And as, lo as, lo as much as it says low, um, I don't know, I'd have to get numbers from uh, the fire chief on on how many calls out, but the idea would be is, is if they go out there, they're, if they're, if it's deemed to be again, a health and safety, it would it would be a high, but for this purposes, the we don't believe it's a high um, number that are that are offending on that. Okay, Madam Clerk, if I could yeah. just for a moment on the, as I say, this is about the methodology involved here. Uh, yes. And I see that you've got now on the parking, you've got all three methods marked and there's certainly different circumstances that I certainly accept that, but I don't know personally, and again, I'll get counsel to chime in on this, the idea that parking is a high priority that again defined as violations likely to cause health and safety issues to the public, where open air burning is a low priority, that seems incongruous to me. It just instinctively. So maybe, again, maybe let's mix this idea a little bit, if I could. Uh, council has suggested that we take this, and do some homework with it. Yeah. Maybe it's take this, do some homework, and reach out to staff to to provide some uh, some further uh, explanation using using this sample uh, as as we do that. Uh, and I come back to council for for direction. What do you want to do this evening with this council? Deputy? I'm in agreement with that. I'm I, I am my I'm swinging my mindset to try <laughs> to catch up to the clerk. 
<laughs> um, there are, but there are, I think it would be not good to follow along Councilor Budrick's suggestion to maybe um, e even have this uh, screen emailed out to us and everyone would be able to take a look at it and I'd be able to get my mind completely where it's supposed to be and uh, we could provide our input then. Sure. Yeah, and I'm not trying to cut off this deliberation or debate, but uh, I'd like it to be practical and efficient <laughs> as well. And, and remember, I, just to follow up, if I may, I, I, I personally wouldn't, I'd appreciate uh, the clerk uh, briefly going through the rest of it, just so we could get a bit of an idea of why that it's set up the way it is, no, the example. Okay, actually, that's an excellent idea. And I did interrupt and my apologies, Madam Clerk, but okay. All right, so why don't we get the clerk to finish off this and then we'll uh, seek to see if council fully agrees with the idea of taking it for homework. Okay. So we'll just, so for the parking, uh, it was a good point on the all three and whether it's high. So the high part would be if somebody is parking on the road, if somebody is, you know, which potentially would uh, block the, uh, or not allow the uh, public works to do their their job to get the roads clean, which potentially could cause an accident. Which so that's where the high part is. Mm -hmm. uh, the parking, you know, during the summer and it's on a street that has no parking. It would be, you know, it would it would it would be a reactive. It would be a a low on the lower end just because it's. Um, it's not uh, health and safety. So that's where it, it's kind of taking all three. So it's not, it's not saying that every parking ticket is going to be seen as high and uh, at a, a, you know, the patrol level because we all know they're not. Um, but the, when it is um, going to create health and safety, it would be considered high. So same with the property standards. It's uh, kind of doing all three because it's when people are out. So if uh, the building inspectors are out and they see one, we get a phone call, um, a neighbor calls, those types of things. That's where it's taking in the service level at all three. And a high, uh, again, uh, some may not be um, health and safety because it's just a I don't know, like a, a board that's off or or something along those lines, but the others could be that the railing is off of a um, balcony, which would then put it high for a health and safety uh, part of things. Uh, same with the safe properties. Um, and we probably could even put patrol on there. Uh, it's not that we have a lot of time uh, for the bylaw officers to be out. They do, there are, they are proactive in it, but I'm not, going to say that they have a, um, a patrol uh, schedule to go out and, and actively patrol every, uh, every street for, uh, for the uh, safe properties or under safe properties. Signed bylaw again, we've got all three. Um, that may be a little aggressive in regards to it being high, but again, the idea is, is if a sign's on a building that's not put up there properly, they don't have a permit. It could be it could be seen as a, a as a um, a high priority in that you want to make sure it's safe where those signs are. That is not going to hurt somebody. Uh, the snow vehicles, very similar to the ATVs. The ability for um, staff uh, to be able to catch anybody on a snowmobile, um, it's not going to happen. Uh, we do get calls to say, you know, they're they're speeding down the road or they're using this. Uh, typically, we would let the OPP know uh, that there's there and hopefully they would patrol in the area because we um we don't have the means to capture them, but uh, uh, you know, again, the, the bylaw would come forward and, and council could put uh, stricter regulations in or, or something along those lines. And then the zoning bylaw, uh, again, we're doing it the, the proactive and the reactive. It's not saying that, they, that there's not a, a patrol component to it, but again, I, they're not going out and actively patrolling on a, on a a patrol level, put it that way, uh, for that bylaw. So, and it would be medium. Again, we try to work with the individuals, let them know that they 
uh, what's happening there or what we've got the complaint on, um, you know, of whether it's permitted, uh, and this goes through the uh, planning department, but what's permitted on the property um, and that type of thing. So it, it's medium. And um, so that's the thought process as those were going, uh, as those were put in, but it, it's not, again, set in stone. Uh, it was uh, at the wish of council. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. It does, I hope that helps all of us to have a better understanding of what what the targets are, are here, what the uh, you know the practical and the rationale behind each of them. Uh, Council, uh, again, we've heard the suggestion, and I think I've seen some concurrence to the idea of you know this going out as homework to each member of council, along with the sample that's been provided by the clerk. Uh, to uh, be collated and brought back to, to another COW. Is that the will of council? And I would look for a motion to that effect if that is. I'll stop sharing your worship. Okay. I see Councillor Buderick's hand. Send it for homework. I'll take that as a motion. Madam Clerk, you understand the motion? <laughs> okay. Yes, do sir. I, I, I couldn't get Do I have a seconder I for that? Deputy, thank you. And, and I found, I think I cut you off again, Councillor Buderick, but it, since it's your motion, you get to speak first if you want to. Uh, I did speak to it earlier, and I think uh, I said my piece then. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Seconder, anyone else? I'm seeing no further comment. I will call the question. All those in favor, please raise a hand. Any opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. And I believe that was our last item on our agenda for today, which brings us to a motion to adjourn. Deputy, so moved. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Gordon, thank you. Any comment? I'll call the question. All those in favor, please raise a hand. Motion is carried. We are adjourned. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Have yourself a great evening and we will see you all next week.